Good morning. I think we will begin. Welcome to the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. I think we're up to the 16th edition. I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm Scott Berg. As I have uh, said at the beginning of these panels every year for the last uh, 15 years, and I will say it again, I can think of no greater gift that a newspaper has bestowed upon a community than this book fair. And I hope you'll just send one word of thanks to, to the Los Angeles Times. It's a real struggle in, in, in these times. Uh, we have the, the pleasure this morning of not just having the author to my right, but having a, a, a whole hour with him alone. Uh, yeah, which is, which is a very nice thing. I will do a brief introduction, then we will get into talking about uh, biography of him and the biographies he has produced. Um, Edmund Morris uh, uh, claims to have been born in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, a lot of us think he was born in Hawaii. Uh, because no, I'm not sure anybody could really write about American history as well as he does. We've never seen a long form of his Nairobi birth certificate, but we were at we, uh, Yes, but I noticed the typewriter looked a little, I don't know. In any case, he, uh, he was then educated in South Africa. Uh, and I will, I will ask him a bit about this too, but he moved on to London and in 1968 emigrated to the United States. His first book, uh, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, was published in 1980, received the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, his sequel to that book, Theodore Rex, uh, won the Los Angeles Times Book Prize in 2002. And now he has just completed the trilogy here with Colonel Roosevelt, which was just nominated for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Uh, along the way, he wrote a fascinating and controversial biography of Ronald Reagan called Dutch, a memoir of Ronald Reagan. And he's also done a little passion project along the way, a little, a little mini biography of Beethoven for the Eminent Lives series. Um, well, the, he is a superb researcher, a lovely stylist. He is truly one of America's greatest storytellers one of the most eminent biographers of our day, and perhaps any day. Please welcome Edmund Morris. As you gathered, I'm also a fan. Um, but I thought, Edmund, since we do have a little time, if we could talk a little about you, um, could you just tell us, I mean, this Africa business, is it to be believed? H how and why were you born in Kenya? And, and how, wh why was your youth in Africa? And how did you make that leap, well, first of all, to, to uh, England? I had absolutely no control over the circumstances of my birth. <laughs> <laughs> all I know is my father, who was an officer in the Royal Air Force and married my mother three days before World War II broke out, he was serving in Kenya, was told that um, he could marry my mother, but uh, he would have exactly one honeymoon night allowed to him, and then he had to report for duty in Dar es Salaam the following day. <coughs> and exactly nine months after that honeymoon <laughs> night, I was born. So let's hear it for Captain Edmund Morris, who, <laughs> who in hour of his country's need, stood up and did duty for the king. <laughs> Um, in a way, it was an advantage being born in a colony uh, to any future writer because um, writers, as I'm sure you know, being one yourself, like to inhabit other lives, other dimensions, other cultures. And uh, if you're born in a colony, particularly one as young as Kenya was, I grew up feeling deprived of the culture of the mattering world. All around me was Africa. No television, hardly any radio, except occasional <coughs> uh, broadcasts from the BBC in London. This is the BBC London sound going in and out. The, the outside world where culture happened, where books were written, 
where movies were made, where symphonies were composed, was all elsewhere. In Shakespeare's phrase, there is a world elsewhere. And I grew up longing for that world. I discovered um, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer at age 10 in the small library in Nairobi, developed a passionate identification with Tom Sawyer to such an extent that I would sit outside this library on the, on the back of the stone lion that, sat, that was carved outside the main steps, looking out over the shabby sprawl of Nairobi. And instead of Nairobi, I would see the Mississippi. <laughs> rolling, 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 and Tom and Huck on a raft. I would passionately want to be with them. So this desire to belong to the world of outside culture was, was part of my upbringing, and it's why when I emigrated here in 1968, it was with no sense of strangeness, I felt I had arrived in the country I'd always wanted to be in. And the culture of that country and the heroes of that culture were available to me to write about. And, and what about formal education? How much did you have and where did that happen? And was London always meant to be a pit stop along the way? Was America your destination in your mind? Yes, London was a pit stop. My, my education was exclusively British public school education. Rather old-fashioned, because in the colonies, you're always about 50 years behind the time. Yeah. So I was brought up on speckled Victorian texts and ancient Latin <coughs> The sort of things the British schoolboys were learning in the 1910s. <laughs> so um, they all derived from Britain and London, and all my teachers were Oxbridge, so I sort of wanted to, to live in Britain. But I always knew somehow I'd end up in the United States. Mm -hmm. And when did you first cross paths with, with Theodore Roosevelt? When would he have entered your consciousness? Of, although you said um, the 1910s, you were... Uh, Oddly enough, it was more or less the same time that I encountered Tom Sawyer. Uh, because Nairobi in the year 1950 celebrated its um, semi-centennial and it put out a little history book about itself with photographs of famous people who'd come to town in the past. And one of them was this for famous former United States president, Theodore Roosevelt. And there was something about the photograph, the teeth, the spectacles, the crooked, um, the pith helmet, <laughs> and the teeth. <laughs> Whenever I see pictures of T.R.'s teeth, I think of that line in one of Somerset Maugham's Ashenden stories. He had rather more teeth than seemed necessary for any practical purpose. <laughs> <laughs> but to a small boy, he, he just looked like a lot of fun. <laughs> and as now as a very old man, I still find him a lot of fun. So you were reading about him. When did you think, when did it first dawn upon you that you might actually write about him? And how did that come about? Oh, I forgot about him. <laughs> the picture impregnated itself in my head, I suppose. But I forgot about him until 1975, <clears throat> when I'd already been living here for several years, hacking it as a young um, aspirant writer, and Nixon resigned the presidency. And in a speech which many of you may remember, he said goodbye to the White House staff and he began to cry. Mm -hmm. And he began to quote something that Theodore Roosevelt had written as a young man when he lost his beautiful young wife, Alice Lee. It was a very poignant little piece mm -hmm. of prose. Um, she, they had never come to her any great sorrow as a fair flower she lived and as a fair flower she died. And I'm thinking, along with most of the United States, what's this got to do with resigning the presidency? <laughs> but it obviously moved Nixon and uh, it interested me. What were the circumstances in which Theodore Roosevelt wrote those rather poignant words? So I looked it up and found that the story of his wife's death was indeed extremely poignant. And I decided to write a screenplay about that period of his life, beginning with the death of his first wife, encounter, encompassing his years out west as a ranch man, and culminating with his self-discovery as a future president at the age of 28. And the whole book grew out of that. And what were you doing before? I mean, you were not a professional screenwriter. You, what did you do by day? Starve. So, but, did you at least nominally have a job, though? No, no. 
Uh, I used to work as an advertising copywriter, which, um, as you know from your own biographical subject, is often a training ground for future writers. I began as um, a copywriter, in fact, in, when I was still in Africa, in Durban, South Africa, working in a menswear store, writing ads selling men's suits and socks to the Zulus of Natal. <laughs> Amazuti, Amasokis, were 12 rand, now 7 rand. Shop at Wolfson's. <laughs> but I do think that a, a training in advertising is a re really fundamental training for a future writer because advertising has to move merchandise. Yes. I had to sell these suits, otherwise I'd be fired. And really, even the most sophisticated biographical writing or writing of any kind is moving merchandise. Yes, no you know, question about that. So, so on spec, you sit down, you write this screenplay. Mm. Did it have any life, any luck? What happened Oh, it's to been that? frequently optioned, and um, <coughs> and um, it's, it's never been. Oh, produced. we've all had those. <laughs> it's possible to live on one's <laughs> options, is it not? But um, the. The book that grew out of it, my agent said to me, since you've written this screenplay, why don't you write um, a short popular biography? So this is the short popular biography. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and okay, day, day one, there's, there's, a, there's a famous cartoon, uh, uh, the first day of digging on the Grand Canyon, and there's a little man with a shovel. You know, uh, What was the first day of digging on your Grand Canyon? I mean, how do you set up shop and say, okay, I'm now a biographer. Um, were you going to libraries? Were you going to the Teddy Roosevelt house and library up in, in Long Island? How do you begin? How do you hang your sh shingle out? I got the contract and yes, and then I had to begin. And where does one begin? I don't know if it was like this with your own books, but presumably each of them grew out of a seed at some point that was planted. Mm -hmm. You were talking about your <coughs> identification with Scott Fitzgerald and Woodrow Wilson at the age of 15, so I'm, maybe that photograph at age 10 was the seed that developed into this, I don't know, but uh, having gotten the contract, um, I was searching around for a way to begin this book, and it occurred to me, Oh yes, I remember I was browsing in a bookstore and quite by chance picked up the Guinness Book of World Records. I'd never looked at it before or since, but I opened it up and it says, on January the 1st, 1907, Theodore Roosevelt shook more hands than any other human being in history <laughs> at a reception in the White House. I thought, I'm gonna investigate that day, January the 1st, 1907, and see how it came that he, he shook so many hands. It turned out that in those days, the President of the United States traditionally opened the White House. Correct. Was that true under Wilson? Uh, no. He, he stopped it? Yeah. Was he the one who stopped it? Yeah. Huh. Well, um, anybody who was decently dressed and had had a bath recently was entitled to visit the White House on New Year's Day and shake hands with the President. Mm -hmm. And this particular day, something like eight, 1,400 people visited the White House and met TR. So I, de I, I, I decided to research that day, find out as much about it as possible, and try and write a prologue which would take the reader imaginatively through the White House, meet this president who was then at his prime. And when you finished reading the prologue, you already are aware of the dimensions of this gigantic character. And the book grew out of that prologue. It took me a year to write, but once I'd written it, I felt that I myself had been through the White House and met him and gotten to appreciate the parameters of him. And then from then on, it was just sheer biographical labor. Yes. And uh, I'm here, it's been 35 years or whatever that you've devoted to Theodore Roosevelt. What is it about Roosevelt? What were the, the elements within that seed that do you think spoke to you so much? I mean, why, why Teddy Roosevelt? And why do, why do we care about him today? Why should we care about him? But most important, why did you care about him? It's mysterious. Um, it's why I was asking you about your three subjects, Wilson and Stevenson and, um, Fitzgerald. and um, Fitzgerald. What yeah. is it about three particular men 
or women for that matter, that makes one develop this vast curiosity. And I, maybe you can answer the question, I can't. All I know is the guy fascinated the hell out of me. Um, he's, he was theatrical, charismatic, probably the greatest gift to personal charm we've ever had in the White House. Um, he was multifaceted and endlessly interesting. And there are just some characters who are like that. Um, Napoleon, Beethoven, Wagner. For some mysterious reason, these men, I'm endlessly interested in them. Others are not. So TR has turned out to be ceaselessly interesting. And in the 30 years I spent writing about him, I've never <coughs> ever ceased to be um, intrigued, often enraged by him, and I am I'm happy to say very often amused by him because he was such a funny person. But frequently in the course of research, I've ended up crying with laughter. He really was so funny. And have your feelings about him changed over the years? Um, yes, to... In what ways? Well, I didn't I mean, who, realize... Who was he at the beginning to you and who is he today to you? At first, it was the drama of his youthful life. This, um, this 40 years, 41 years, 42 years, mm -hmm. which led up to the, his assumption of the presidency. He's the youngest president <clears throat> we've ever had. And the story of that rise of Theodore Roosevelt was so improbable, so full of adventure, so narratively um, exciting that the, I wanted to write the book simply because of the narrative drama and the enjoyment of telling a terrific story. The second book I found difficult because it's about his presidency and politics does not come naturally to me. I find it difficult to write about the abstractions of, polit of politics. Um, the third book about his post-presidential life um, did reveal a new Roosevelt to me that I hadn't quite realized existed. I always knew that this was one of the broadest intellects we've had in the White House the complete range of his, of his knowledge and, and skills. This was a paleontologist, um, a professional ornithologist, a historian, a soldier, a politician, a president, a multiplicity of different things, and a man who read on average one book a day and wrote 40 books. So I knew he had a broad mind, but until I read this, wrote this third book, I didn't realize how deep his mind was, and how cerebral, and how he in fact was a genuinely literary person who could have had an equally distinguished career if he had stuck to literature. Mm -hmm. And at what point did you realize uh, that this was not going to be just one small volume on Theodore Roosevelt? At what point in writing your first book did you realize no one book isn't going to do it? Pretty soon, because um, there was such, uh, the, the climax of his pre-presidential life happened to, to be so <coughs> cinematically dramatic that I knew I couldn't go beyond that point. Mm -hmm. He had the gift of living as though his life was a movie. Uh, any other vice president of the United States, hearing that the president has been assassinated and that he's now president, would have been in his office in Washington or a club somewhere. Theodore Roosevelt had to be on the top of the tallest mountain in New York State, Mount Marcy, on that September day when he saw this ranger coming, running up through the trees with a telegram. And as soon as he saw the telegram, which was yellow, he said himself, I knew what message that man was bringing. Now, no writer could go beyond a cliffhanger as exciting as that. So I knew the first book would have to end at that moment, the ranger coming up through the trees. And therefore, the second book naturally would have to be the story of his presidency, 1901 to 1909, and therefore, the story of his last 10 years of life would be the third volume. So it was pretty obvious to me early on it would have to be a trilogy. Yes. Uh, you, you should know, Edmund really should write for soap operas. What he has just told you about the end of that first volume is so your heart is just pounding as he sees the, the messenger coming, and then you turn the page, and it's 
over. <laughs> there's, no, there's no more book. So you know, it's like waiting. We're waiting for the presidency, which indeed does come and, and is a rather interesting presidency. Are there, were you aware as you were doing it of themes that either surfaced in the writing of the first book that you wanted to sustain throughout the book? Or was this not even a thought at all that there are certain fugue-like ideas you wanted to carry throughout, because you knew it was a trilogy going in even. Uh, so presumably you knew one book was going to be the presidency and then one was going to be the post-presidency. Uh, but were you aware of elements of, of TR that you thought you would want to follow all that way, or am I making more of this than there is? No, I like that question a lot. I love that phrase, fugue-like. There is much to be that is contrapuntal about the writing of a biography. Fugue comes from the Latin fugus, which means flight. And um, I'm sure you had this feeling writing your own books that your subject is in, in flight and you have to pursue him down the avenues and down the ways. Yeah. Fugues also have interlocking, inter intertwining strands. And any biography has to consist of one or two or three or four or maybe more, strands which eventually resolve as a fugue resolves. Uh, what I felt writing the first book was that the first 40 years certainly were a rise. And I noticed that wherever he was at any stage of his life, <coughs> physically he would always have to climb the highest mountain or hill that was in the vicinity. When he was in Maine, he climbed Mount Katahdin. When he was in Europe on honeymoon, he climbed the Matterhorn. When he was in, San, in Cuba, in the Spanish American War, he had to charge up San Juan Hill. He was always charging up heights, Capitol Hill in Washington. So I had the feeling of a range of hills, a running image, rising, 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 until he finally stood on that final peak and heard the news that he was president. So there was a running metaphor through that book. Through the second book, the running metaphor was trains. Presidents in those days were ceaselessly on trains, crisscrossing the country. And T.R., who was himself frequently compared to a steam train, yeah. steam train in trousers, they called him, was forever riding on trains and wanting to get up on the, in the cab with the, the engineer and, and pretend to be driving them himself. So the theme of, of uh, trains and railroads runs throughout that book. It ends with... I had difficulty bringing it to an end. How do you bring to an end a large book about a two-term president? Well, he got on a train after, he, after Taft was inaugurated. And he um, steamed out of Washington's Union <coughs> Station and disappeared. I was looking for an eloquent last line to the book. Couldn't come out with one. And then looking through some old stereo optican pictures, I came across an image of, taken from the caboose of a presidential train during TR's presidency. The cameraman was on the caboose photographing Taylor, Texas as the train left <coughs> town. And you see all these school children, black and white, little girls, little boys, and adults running after the train. And the rails recede into perspective. And it's like he was on the train and this is what he saw as he pulled away from these, these people. So I used that image rather than a sentence to end the book. Mm -hmm. And um, the third book, um, I don't think there is an underlying metaphor, but the, all the strands of the fugue came together at the end when he died in 1919 at the age of 60 in a death which, um, which more or less uh, brought to a final tragic culmination all the various impulses of his life, his desire to be a hero in battle, um, his desire to write, his desire to rule, all these were finally frustrated and he died, very tragically, on January the 6th, 1919. I think what we're hearing is, even though he writes biographies, what he really wants to do is direct. Did. Teddy Roosevelt grow as a man, as a thinker, as a 
politician? Do you think he, he changed? Um, and, and this is sort of related to why should we care about Theodore Roosevelt today? Let's, it's, it's a legacy question in a way. We don't have to care about him. In fact, uh, quite a few people, including somebody at this table, uh, does not care about him at all. <laughs> but we certainly have to... I care about him, I don't care for ...acknowledge him. that he mattered. Yes. He mattered enormously. One of the largest figures in our history. And as controversial today now as he was then. Uh, did he grow? Yes, he did. Uh, he was a patrician person. Uh, born in the first ranks of the New York, of New York 400 society, born to wealth and privilege, and he became a genuine Democrat with a small d, who uh, turned out to be an astonishingly radical president. Mm -hmm. uh, he came in at, at the age of 42, uh, rather cautious and conservative, but in the course of his second term, he became so progressive, so radical, that the um, the entrenched interests of Wall Street and the Conservative Congress frequently and seriously uh, stated that they thought he was insane. And um, he, his radicalism culminated in the Progressive Party campaign of 1912, where on, on a platform, some of, who's, of the tenets of that platform were so advanced that they didn't achieve culmination until the uh, New Deal days of Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. So politically, he swung very much to the left in the course of his life and tended to swing back toward the center before he died. So he grew and changed ceaselessly throughout his life. And as a writer, did you feel you changed uh, the way you wrote as the books progressed and as you learned more about writing biography? And Do you feel there are any stylistic shifts or were there shifts in the way you approached your subject, researched your subject, attacked your subject, uh, from book to book to book? I think I changed somewhat, yes. In the first book, um, there were editorial inflections. Every <clears throat> now and again, the author would tell you, the reader, what he thought about the subject, and would occasionally say, this is how we look at this issue from this point of view in 19... 1979 when I was writing it. Presentism, in other words. Yeah. Looking back at the past from the present. And I, I think this is something I tried to eliminate in the subsequent books. Mm -hmm. By the time I wrote Theodore Rex, I eliminated the author totally, I believe, so that you just feel when you read it that you are back in 1909 and that there is no intrusion of the present upon it. Mm -hmm. And that sustains in the third book as well. Yeah. Um, and why didn't he run in, in 1908? Well, in those days, of course, a president could run for as many terms as he liked. George Washington established the precedent. It was not a constitutional president. It was a president that... Uh, Two terms were enough for any man. And subsequent presidents honored that, and T.R. decided to honor it himself. Even though he was so young, he was still just 48 years old in 1908, hugely popular, with almost total command over the machinery of government, he had a third term on a platter, yeah. silver platter, and he turned it down, believing that too much power is too much for any one man, that power is a temporary, presidential power is a temporary gift to the American people and should be returned to them in due course. So he gave it up and I thought that was a genuinely noble gesture because every fiber of his body wanted to stay in the White House. He was still so young and so vital and he had all these ambitions. But he gave it up and of course regretted it as soon as he gave it up and came back in 1912 to try and re reclaim it. And that was his tragic mistake. And did he not spend the rest of his life, in fact, trying to recapture that power? And, mm. and indeed, you point out he died in 1919, but in his mind, in the minds of many, he was going to run again in 1920. Would he not have? If he had run in 1920, I hate to speculate, but this yes, is pretty well too. certain. 
um, there was such a Republican landslide that year that um, nobody, no Democrat could have won. So when T.R. died at the beginning of 1919, he was the, without question, would have been the nominee for the presidency again on the Republican ticket, and he would have become president. Mm -hmm. But uh, he died. <laughs> uh, and what do you think are the great elements of the T.R. legacy? either as president or, or, or extra presidential even. I mean, again, what, how does he resonate today? What are the, what are the elements that, that uh, TR left to American culture, American politics, American history? Why is he chiseled on Mount Rushmore, you know? Well, conservation beyond any question was his greatest contribution to our history. When he became president in 1901, the word conversation, uh, conservation uh, in its contemporary sense, it was not even in the dictionary. He popularized and democratized and publicized the notion of conservation <coughs> of national resources. The very first surviving letter that exists from his 10th year contains a complaint about trees being cut down. Mm. He had a passionate identification with the American landscape and this awareness that um, the natural cover, the forestation in the United States was already half gone by the time he became president. Uh, animals and our wildlife were being depleted to pollution, industrial, all these things. And he, throughout his presidency, made conservation his major tenet of policy and brought about the great Governor's Conference of 1908, which was the first inventory, inventory of our national resources and put conservation on the map and in the consciousness of the American people. And historically speaking, this, I think, is his greatest achievement. Mm -hmm. And what other things might we put on, on the positive list? Because you know where I'm going to go next. Um, yeah, I'm actually waiting for that. So, <laughs> The regulatory philosophy. His other major passion was executive regulation of, of um, bi the, the combination of big business and Wall Street banking and conservative lawmakers. He believed that the federal government, particularly the White House, the executive branch of government, should have strong, extremely strong uh, regulatory power over all American institutions. And that is a philosophy which has become increasingly fraught, in a, as we know, in the last few years. All his speeches on the subject, which are manifold, could be recycled today with hardly a word to be changed. Yeah, it's true enough. Now, some people think um, <laughs> well, that Theodore Roosevelt might be the poster boy for the ugly American, for the, the uh, egotistical, imperialistic, jingoistic, uh, bloodthirsty, exceptionalistic. <laughs> dive in whenever anyone wants to. No, but, it w but was Theodore Roosevelt not those things? Did he not? begin that? Is that not part of his legacy as well? And if so, how do we reconcile that? Well, he's like New York City. Whatever you say about him is true. <laughs> <laughs> he was imperialistic. He had a sick um, idealization, romanticization of war. He loved blood. He loved to kill. Um, he became almost, um, almost um, savage in his exaltation whenever he killed a large animal. The prologue to Colonel Roosevelt makes a lot of people sick with yeah, its, its descriptions of all the animals he killed, even though it was a scientific safari. Um, the former President of the United States squatting down with naked Turkana warriors at midnight having killed this elephant, eating slices of its heart which he'd roasted in the fire. He exulted in this kind of thing. Aspects uh, of his character which I find quite repulsive and incomprehensible. He believed in the superiority of uh, great, uh, preferably white nations that had um, abundant military power over nations which were weak and effete. He was not specifically a racist. For example, he admired the Japanese who were traditionally dismissed by most Americans as Orientals and yellow bellies. He always thought they were a superior race, superior to the Russians, for example, 
because their martial values were superior, their culture was more refined. So he was not specifically racist, but he did believe that black Americans were on the whole inferior to white Americans, and that only a small minority of them, uh, personified Booker T. Washington, were entitled to sit in council with, um, with he and his, um, his fellows. So he was, um, in many ways, a 19th century figure, and many of his values are hard for us to take today. And I don't think I've camouflaged these aspects of his gigantic character, and I certainly never have tried to make sense of the conflicting aspects of his personality, because he was polygonal, and if you look at a polygon, you can never see all of its facets at once. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think you camouflage anything at all, but it, it makes me, as, as I was reading, well, actually, especially this third volume, I think, uh, it really made me wonder, though, why the cult is still so, so strong. I mean, I, I can see why John McCain rallies around a, a TR, um, and I can see why certain fringes of certain parties do. Uh, but I, there's such a strong feeling, a positive feeling about, about Theodore Roosevelt today. And I'm wondering, a century later, and as you point out, he is rather a 19th century figure. I'm wondering why it, it still plays so well uh, for the modern audience. Well, I think the sum total of his personality was positive. He represented the dignity of the United States. He was a genuine Democrat. He, um, he uh, took life as a gift and believed that life, every aspect of it, including hunting, um, every one of its manifold aspects should be embraced with all his, the passion he could summon. He understood birds, beasts, and flowers. He understood how human beings operate. He was deeply cultivated. Um, he was passionately interested in other cultures. He had a strong, overridingly strong moral instinct. He believed in loyalty. Uh, he believed in the institution of marriage. He loved his wives, his two wives and his children, deeply. Uh, he was, as I said in the last line of the book, where as a little boy wrote in 19, shortly after he died, and I quote this at the end of my third book, he was the fulfiller of good intentions. <coughs> and if he has aspects of his character that repulse us or bewilder us or amuse us today, that's because um, he was so superabundantly large, and he did live in another age. As L. P. Hartley once famously said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. <laughs> yes, they do. Now, I've been spending time with somebody who was sharing the age with him, his rival, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, that uncircumcised skunk in the White House. Yes, <laughs> yes him. Um, I'm quoting T.R. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and why do you think that antipathy was so great? I mean, they, I mean here was somebody, Wilson. Uh, what made T.R. so crazy? The idealism? The, they certainly shared a vision. Of, well, they certainly believed in internationalism, that the United States had a place at the world table, uh, but it, it seems at a certain point that anything Woodrow Wilson says, even before he says it, T.R. disagrees with it. Not altogether. He liked him a lot, you know. When Wilson, when Wilson became president of Princeton University, T.R. liked him, and um, they, I think, had liked each other and admired each other quite some. Yes. Gradually, as the presidency progressed and Wilson became more and more conscious of his future as a, as a politician, uh, they began to drift apart. And when they began to compete for the presidency in uh, 1911 and 12, naturally, as Democrat and Republican, both sharing a progressive philosophy, which they thought best suited themselves, naturally they began to become rivals. Wilson wrote quite a few snide things about T.R., and T.R. Shaw came out with a lot of uh, snide remarks of his own. But even so, the campaign of 1912 was a fairly gentlemanly one. The rhetoric was not vituperative. It was a, it was a decent, decent campaign yes. between two men with completely different political philosophies. 
No, not entirely different. They were both sincere progressives. But the one was a Democrat and the other was a Republican. The antipathy, in mm. fact, did not even show itself in 1914 when Theodore Roosevelt uh, visited the White House after his famous expedition to Brazil. Uh, he dropped in a courtesy call on the new president, Woodrow Wilson, and they had a very pleasant lemonade tea yeah. in the portico of the White House. And it was after that meeting that Wilson famously said, he's just like a big boy. There's a sweetness about him that you cannot resist. So they got on great. But as soon as the war broke out in 1914, TR, very shortly afterwards, although he had first supported Wilson's policy of neutrality, United States, supported him and issued public statements that we must stand behind the president. By 19, the May of 1915, when the Lusitania was sunk, that's when Wilson famously, or infamously as TR would say, said there is such a thing as a nation being too proud to fight. That to TR was pusillanimous, and Wilson's policy of pacifism and neutrality after that prov prov provocation completely infuriated TR. He began to equate Wilson with weakness, lack of masculinity, cowardice, and uh, the frustration of being out of office himself and being unable to prosecute a war that he felt the United States should get into caused him to begin to fester. And his hatred of Wilson became so obsessive that some of his later letters uh, and diatribes against Wilson make very painful reading to this day. Yeah, it really did become an obsession, it, it, mm. it, it seemed. And then, of course, uh, uh, he wanted to get into the war himself. That is, T.R. wanted to, to fight mm. and have his own. Went to the White yeah. House and begged Wilson to let him raise a volunteer division. Yes. And Wilson, quite justifiably and rightly, said no. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might talk uh, for a moment about uh, because I think it relates to some of these themes we've been talking about too, uh, his son Quentin and his relationship with that. And I'm, uh, where I'm going to lead toward this is if there's, there's almost the element of a Greek tragedy, I think, to T.R.'s life in some ways and what uh, his son going off to war and so forth. And that story. You might want to he had four sons whom he sent to the Western Front in his stead, Wilson denied him per permission to raise a division of volunteer American soldiers to go over to Europe in advance of the regular army we were raising. <coughs> denied TR that permission for obvious reasons. He was 58 years old. He had a romantic, out-of-date out, out of notion of warfare as cavalry charges and romance. Wilson knew that war had become brutal and mechanized and that he, the former president, leading troops into battle would be a grotesque and vulnerable provocation to the Germans. So he refused to let TR do this, and TR was obliged to send his four sons to, into battle in his stead. And although he never explicitly said this, it's quite plain from his letters and his remarks that he hoped that these boys would distinguish themselves by being wounded and perhaps killed in battle. That was his notion of a glorious death. So he got his wish. The youngest and the brightest of them, Quentin, the one most like himself, the one least willing to go to the war, uh, got shot down as a fighter pilot in August of 1918. Yeah. It's a photograph of Quentin lying dead beside his plane, which I reproduce in, in the, the book. book yeah. And when you look at this picture and you see the horror of it, this dead boy looking like a steer fallen off a hook in an abattoir, you can understand how <coughs> T.R. himself overnight lost all his romantic notions of the glory of war and realized how ugly it was. And he died deeply disillusioned as a result, just a few months later. Yes. Um. In putting these books together, because you, you began in the uh, mid-70s working with Teddy Roosevelt, mm. I want to talk a little just about, about your, your methodology. 
there would have been some people for you to talk to who knew TR directly, um, starting with his daughter Alice, I mm -hmm. presume. Were there other people? Uh, why, uh, a, might you tell a little about her or any conversations you had with her? W were interviews of any use to you? Uh, if so, and if not, what were your primary sources in putting these books together? Where did you go to do the research and so forth? I interviewed Alice, who was very old when I met her, Alice Longworth, and uh, also Archie, his son Archie. Yes, yeah, right. He was and um, that was it, the surviving children. So most of my information came from the superabundant record that he left behind. He was conscious from early childhood onward that he was going to matter greatly. So he kept every scrap, every diary, every letter, 150,000 letters. <coughs> he kept diaries, for example, of his um, four years at Harvard when he was pursuing this gorgeous girl, Alice Hathaway Lee. And I, myself, as a voyeuristic biographer, uh, enjoyed the, reading about this pursuit of Alice because I found her so attractive myself. She was gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, therefore, when he finally married her on his graduation day, I was really <laughs> anxious to find what it's going to be like in bed with Alice. <laughs> and I turned the page and he says, our sacred happiness is too private to be written about. <laughs> And I had the distinct feeling I was being addressed. <laughs> In other words, and I'm sincere about this, he knew that one day, a century hence, some beady-eyed yes. biographer <laughs> was going to be reading about his honeymoon, and he was in effect saying, this is private fella, keep out of this. So he knew his future worth, and therefore he kept everything. And um, it was a luxury to have so much stuff to, to, to build a book upon. Yes. Um, and, and just to deviate for a moment, but I, uh, I, I just thought we might take a moment to, if you would, just talk about your, your Reagan book, uh, just because Edmund had this singular experience of being granted access to Ronald Reagan during the White House years. I'm, I'm just wondering if you might just take a moment just to tell us how it came about and what you were attempting to do, and you, you wrote it in a totally uh, unorthodox manner. I'm just wondering if you just, as long as we have you here, you might just take a moment to address that book. Yeah, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> I've never had so much fun writing a book. I consider it my best book, and um, I loved every minute of it, even though it took 15 years. Yes. Um, however, it was wildly controversial because it used the device of an imaginary narrator telling a non-fiction story. Um, the thing with Reagan was, as I realized when I became his authorized biographer, that he was by nature thespian. Reagan was born to perform, and without an audience, Reagan was nothing. When you were in the Oval Office with him, alone, you could not believe how banal and boring and empty he was. <coughs> And you kept saying to them, my God, this guy's president of the United States. But as soon as two or three other people came into the Oval Office, or he stepped out and began to perform, he was magical. He was commanding. He was a forceful and formidable <coughs> operator. And so I realized that he could only be understood in terms of performance. He had, in private, like many theatrical people, I'm sure you've you noticed this in your own life, Many actors have no personality at all in private. They are empty people. They need to be filled with their roles and then they become. Reagan was like that. So therefore, I felt that the biographer should be a spectator to Reagan's performance. And I simply extended myself back into his early days as a contemporary who lived in approximately similar circumstances, or at least within proximity of Reagan, and became gradually aware as the years went by that this uh, nondescript Midwestern boy was going to amount to something. Became an actor, and then a union president, and a soldier, and a governor, and finally the most powerful man in the world. So that's why the book was so controversial, in that it was a meticulously researched and documented book. Every single fact of Reagan's life is authentic. 
But the literary technique was uh, revolutionary. It couldn't be more different from the technique that I used in these books. Absolutely. Because in this case, the character could speak for himself. But in Reagan's case, the biographer had to communicate the magic of the performance. And on another unrelated topic, uh, uh, I just want to ask, it's unusual to have a husband and wife team who write biographies, and you are married to a biographer as well, Sylvia Morris, uh, who has written one wonderful volume about Claire Booth Luce, um, and also wrote a book about Edith Roosevelt. Now, was that, that was while you were doing TR, yes? What, the Edith yeah, Roosevelt? when I started my first book. Yeah, so, um, so now what is this like for the Morrises to sit down when each of them is writing about a Roosevelt and do become Teddy and Edith at breakfast? It sounds cloyingly cozy, but it's not. Um, strangely enough, we're such different people and we write so differently and think so differently that um, we had very little... Yeah. Well, nothing, uh, nothing of any substance would pass between us. She writes in a different way than I do. Um, she, if we ever did collaborate on something, and that's inconceivable, <laughs> she would supply the nouns and I would supply the adjectives. Oh, I see. She's verbal, oral, she needs to talk. When she writes something, she has to read it to me and talk to me. But I find it difficult to respond because I can only understand what I read. And I personally cannot talk about what I'm writing. So there's not very much communication between us. Um, after we've published our particular books, then we talk about them. Yes. She's now writing the second volume of her life of Claire Bethlouse, and I have no idea which way it's going. And uh, speaking of the, of the future, well, actually, I wanted to ask one question before I get to your future, but uh, that is, What's the feeling when you finished 30 plus years of living with somebody, and that is Theodore Roosevelt, this huge character you've had in your, in your life every day. How do you feel when it's all done? Well, Scott, um, I'm tempted to ask you the same question. I think most biographers who write big books that take many years to write, big biographical books, become so obsessed with their subjects that they cannot depart from them afterwards. Arthur Link, whom I'm sure you, you knew, the great yes. uh, Wilson scholar at Princeton University, devoted his whole life to Woodrow Wilson, could talk about nothing else, and in fact began to look like Woodrow Wilson to Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> and if you said anything to him that was remotely critical, he would go into a frenzy. Yeah. Um, I personally am not like that. As soon as I'm finished with somebody, whether it was Reagan or Beethoven or Theodore Roosevelt, he instantly evaporates from my head and I find it difficult to think about him afterwards and feel no feeling of um, sadness when the book is over. I was pleased to kill him off <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that uh, it was a completion of a task. I felt a calm satisfaction. And since last February, when I finished the book, apart from publicizing it, I've hardly thought about him. And do you know where you're going next? I have an idea, but it's not really, it's still private and um, I haven't quite decided. But if I do do it, it certainly will not be a political book. It'll be quite different from what I've done in the past. Uh, but would it be a biography? Yeah. I see, so the, a subject you're checking out, thinking about. Um, well, I think as you've, um, oh yes, what, well, did you have a question? Go for it, go. Well, a hundred years ago, the American people were terribly concerned, the middle-class American people, 
were terribly, passionately, angrily concerned about uh, the rampant growth of the great unregulated uh, corporate institutions, particularly abused by bankers. It was as passionate and, and um, fraught a subject a hundred years ago as it is now. The Tea Party movement is not quite as sophisticated as the progressive movement, but its passions derive from the same causes. The feeling of impotence amongst ordinary people who find that they are spending more and more of their income on taxes and that um, the, 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 the country is controlled by non-democratic institutions that they cannot personally control themselves. So there are many parallels between then and now. And that's why a lot of TR's rhetoric from 1912 could be recycled today. Yes, sir. Mm. Yes, it's a nonsensical book. He says, amongst other things, that we stole the Panama Canal from <coughs> Venezuela. Um, TR, as I said earlier on, greatly respected the Japanese, but was aware from the 1890s onward that they were a potential danger to the security of the United States. He set to the Naval War College in, I think, 1896, a strategic problem for them to solve. Japan attacks the Hawaiian Islands. How did the United States respond? So the premise of this book, the TR as president, uh, had a diplomatic initiative which um, enabled the Japanese to become a superpower to, and to attack us in World War II is just fatuous. Uh, and it's been pretty severely criticized by serious historians. I'm afraid our time has run out. I think as you've heard, um, Edmund is extremely eloquent on the subject of Theodore Roosevelt and other things. The only thing he does better, I think, is write about <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt. He will be at the signing area two, uh, where you can get, I, I'm sure, all of the books, but I especially recommend this third volume of the trilogy, the Colonel, uh, Colonel Roosevelt. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you.